Expectations is a Christian program that discusses a number of issues, including your health, choosing to be single and living a fulfilled life, issues of marriage and how your marriage life can have a resemblance of good traits of heaven, such as joy, peace and love. End time events are also not left out. The passage of homosexuality into law in America, terrorist attacks, war, corruption, disease and hunger. There are poetry recitals. There is only the phantom from drama who hears the drum louder. Pam, pam, serada. Song ministrations and movies. Expectations is simply about how it all began. How it's all going to end. Expectations, Jesus is on his New Year's Day and a very warm welcome to you on the program Expectations. Expectations. It's on GTV Life, Your Religion, and Culture Channel. My name is Ernest Entribu Siakon. And because it's New Year, we know most of you would have uh, made or outlined some um, resolutions in which you would like to achieve. But we also want you to know that um, don't neglect the God factor, you know, in, in, in making the indefatigable effort to attain those goals, aspirations, and dreams. But also uh, make sure that Whatever you do, Jesus is part of those aspirations in attaining those goals as the year unfolds. So, but you know, it's quite interesting that in the year 2016, most of you um, sent questions and comments on our social media pl platform indicating that and asking questions as to whether Jesus is God. And I find that quite intriguing. So, because of that emanated questions from you out there, we want to treat that particular um, topic and um, um, question for you, and then we can put that issue to bed once and for all. So I have been joined by um, no other person than Mr. Osei Kweku of the Valley View University um, Church. And Mr. Osei, you are welcome to the studios of GTV Life. Thank you very much. And happy New Year. <laughs> happy, happy New Year and many, many happy returns. <laughs> all right. So um, I'll go straight to the point and um, Mr. Osei, let me put you on the spot. This is a question that most of our viewers are asking. And I, th I, I find it quite, you know, um, a bit baffling and a bit, you know, as a Christian. I think in, this, in the, in the, in the um, outskirts of Christianity, some Christians do, or most Christians, I would say, believe that indeed Jesus is God. But how about those set of Christians who sometimes say, well, he is just man, okay, and, you know, as a prophet joined um, Christianity, I mean, joined humankind to save us. But my question to you right away, and I'm playing the devil's advocates here, is Jesus God, as most of our viewers are asking? Is he God? Thank you very much. Most certainly he is. Mm. And the Bible makes that amply clear. All right. So that's a direct um, answer from Mr. Sekoku. Mr. Sekoku indeed believes that Jesus is God. But how do you explain to the doubters, those who perhaps may not agree with you, to that assertion that indeed he is God? Thank you very much. Uh, when we look, I uh, think that before we ask, uh, answer that question, we'll have to look at the whole issue of the God factor. Okay. Of course, there's no searching out God. Job mm. tells us, can you by searching find out the Almighty? Most certainly we can't. We are so finite and he's so infinite that mm. we can't know all there is about God, but we, at least... That which is revealed to us is for us, and that, that we can know. We have, okay. we know that uh, it, talking about Jesus being God, it manages from the uh, fact that people look at Deuteronomy chapter six, verse four, and says, which says that the Lord our God, here O Israel, mm. the Lord our God is one. Indeed, God is one. So people are baffled as to the issue of uh, Trinity and God. Yes, exactly. it is not in the Bible. You don't find the word Trinity, Trinity the or God, the God in the Bible, as it were. But in spite of the fact that God is one, mm -hmm. you see right from the beginning of the Word of God, Genesis, up to the end, the issue of God being somewhat plural. Mm -hmm. Because uh, in Genesis one twenty seven. After verse 1, Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, I've told that, took that to us about in the beginning, God. So God is the beginning. Okay. So when we're talking about the nature of God, He is eternal. He is the beginning. But right in Genesis 127, we hear these words that God said, let us, God said, let us make man mm. in our own image. Who was he talking to? 
let us make man. And God as creator will now go and uh, discuss creation as it were with people, who are, uh, other beings who are lesser than God. Mm. So we really want to believe that. Uh, so, so from your um, submissions, you are saying that the acts there in Genesis seem to attest that indeed God was speaking to some other persons that were of the same status as he is. Yeah, as the doctrine okay. of uh, the Trinity uh, tried to bring out. Because right. not only there, um, after man has sinned, mm. again God says, um, the man has become like one of us. And you can find that in Genesis uh, chapter 2. Okay. Uh, chapter 3, sorry. So we, we see that. And then again, when in the early time of the rebellion, when um, after the flood, mm. you realize that the rest had come and they built this tower, the Tower of Babel, in order to escape another deluge. So the Bible says that God said, let us go now down there and confuse their language. Okay, so again, again, you find, you find, you find the mm. us there. But before we go on to that, we'll, we'll try to look at who is God. Okay. And okay. we know that God is eternal. When you read this God who we're saying is one, mm. Psalm 90 verse 2 tells us that God is eternal. He's also omnipresent. In other words, he's everywhere. In fact, that's uh, one beautiful, uh, this thing you can find is in Psalm 139. Mm. It, talk, it compares who we are as human beings to God. And especially verses 7 to 12, it talks about how you cannot escape the presence of God. That even darkness is light to him. And wherever you go to the ends of the world, he is there. Mm. So God is everywhere. And even right within uh, the, our womb. I mean, he conceived of us. So God and then he designed us. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. he's everywhere. He's also omnipotent. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar, uh, if, with time we want to read that, that Cain, who was an emperor, as it mm. were, Cain mm. at that time was a then known world. After he's been so proud and God brought him low, he actually acknowledges that God is all powerful. Okay. Yeah. So the Cain said that. Yeah, he said that. In mm. Malachi chapter 3, we see God mm. is immutable. He doesn't change. God okay. himself said, I'm the Lord, I change not. So these are, you could say, the attributes of, uh, of God. His right. nature, we know he's holy. Why we are trying to look at these uh, attributes and nature is that we will realize that Jesus also has these same attributes and nature. Mm. Yeah, and mm. then we, as uh, we progress, we may right. want to find out. God is holy, God is righteous, he's just, he's loving. In fact, he's love. It's not just loving. The Bible says that God it's is love. love. Okay. He's also merciful and he's truthful. These are his uh, the attributes yeah of, okay and god, god jesus says he's not just truthful but he's a truth mm. so we'll come to that mm. as we mm. we, we mm. just oppose it's that okay. it, godliness as it were of jesus uh, to what constitutes yeah. god, god exactly yeah. all right so having taken us through that one it seems that um sometimes most viewers or let's say those who seem to have this doubt about jesus being god they seem to hit so much on the Trinity, the issue of the Trinity. Yeah. So what, in your estimation or in your research, what can you tell us, or viewers, our viewers in particular, who are always asking this particular question yeah. about the Trinity? Yeah. Like, sorry. Exactly. sorry, like we said earlier, you will not find the word Trinity, Trinity. Mm. in the Bible, mm. but there are ample evidence that gives us these three co-eternal persons. Mm. We, like we, we said in Genesis chapter 1, 26 and 27, we see, let us make man in our own image. But the word that, that they tell us in Hebrew that is used, Elohim, signifies more than one and okay. even more than two. Uh, uh, so that, that one is there. And I think we also touch on Genesis chapter 3, verse 22, mm. when man has sinned. And God said, the man has become like us, like, that, yeah, okay. like us, knowing good and evil. Mm. And again, when we look at uh, Genesis eleven seven, we when God came to confound the people of Babel so that they will not continue to build that tower, he says, let us go down. Again, it's interesting that when you read Isaiah chapter 6 verse 8, Isaiah in a vision sees God, and God is asking a question in the first person. He says, who shall I send? But then he continues to say, and who will go for us? Mm. So, so it, it mm. is there. Again, Jesus comes down, and then he's talking about his disciples. That you should go and also make disciples. Mm. At the end of the day, when they are going to be baptized, he says, you baptize them in the name of the Father, mm. the Son, and the Holy Ghost, or the Holy Spirit. Okay, so and there's three, a, three personalities. Yeah, three personalities, yeah. Mm. And then there's this popular one that every Christian talked about when we say the grace. And I think we can say it together. We said, 
for the, the love of God and the, sweet of the Holy and Spirit. the grace of our Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ and the fellowship of okay. the Holy Spirit. Okay. So again, we see the Trinity popping up there, the mm. three the co-eternal God. They all share the same attributes and quality that we said. Okay. That we so talk about Holy Spirit. Briefly, what can you tell us in relation to you know, the three personalities still being that one same God? Because we know as Christians that God is one. Yes. So God is one, but still three personalities. How do yeah. you explain that? God is one in purpose. God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they are all love. So the attributes we talk about, they are all holy, they are just and righteous. Mm -hmm. And whatever they set out to do, they do, they have the same aim. It's almost like um, bringing it down, even though imperfectly, what you can have a company where maybe three people, the directors have equal shares, but all of them cannot be CEOs. So one may be, in may be the CEO, one may be in charge of operations, another may be in charge of administration, but they all have equal share and equal power. Mm -hmm. So that is, that is the way it, it goes. I know there are some Christians that tend to sort of play it down Sometimes, because we look at the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we want mm. to look okay. at it yeah, uh, in terms of uh, okay. maybe one is superior. But the, the, this whole thing, to begin with, like we said, Job said, you can't by searching know out God. Mm. And uh, mm. First Timothy 3, 16 tells us that we'll there's a mystery completely. about okay. this godliness, mm. this whole issue of God. It's a mystery. Okay. It's just what little he's revealed to us is what we are looking at. All right. So, um, talking about this uh, trinity... Mm. Yeah, there's a limit to which we, we, we could go. We could go. Yeah. All right. So then, now let's look at the identity of Jesus himself. Thank you. And then we juxtapose that, like you said, with the what constitutes the nature of God. So let's look at the identity of Jesus. Okay. Mm. We know that Jesus, I mean, he he's coming, his incarnation, as we see, he becoming a man. Mm. Well, right from, maybe we want to read this. The famous uh, John chapter 1, verse 1 to 3. That talks about the introduction, as it were, of Jesus. Mm. Earlier on, we know him as God, uh, the Son, or God. Yeah, so let's look at John chapter 1, verse okay. 1 to 3. He said, in the beginning mm. was a word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Okay. It says, he was in the beginning with God, that's verse 2. All things were created through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Mm. Mm. In him was life, and the light life was the light of men and the light shines in the darkness and the darkness did not comprehend it that is five when we look at uh, 14 and 15 it says and the word became flesh mm -hmm. that's incarnation and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory of the only begotten of the father that word uh, the true explanation that when you look at amplified is the unique son of god okay the begotten there is not talking about uh, like birth, yeah. yeah. So it's uniqueness. That's what we are talking about. And uh, he said, we have that glory, full of grace and truth. Mm -hmm. And then Joe bore, Joe, John bore witness of him and cried out, this is one of whom I said that, yeah. And I think I want to add 18. He says, no one has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, or the only unique son, if you like, um, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. Okay. All right. There are, there are, in fact, even in Christianity, there are those that want to not subordinating the role of Jesus, but some mm. of them actually look at him as not God, like a, crea a, a creature. Okay. But what we read is that without him, nothing, nothing was, was made, made that was made. So if he is a creature, who created him? Then you want to say God. Yeah. But he is a word. Mm. And all things were created by the word, mm. by the breath of the Lord, where the uh, word made. And he said he spoke or he commanded, and things just came into being. So the word which is God, in, uh, the incarnate word of God, which is Jesus, mm. he created all these things. And then you, you, there are a lot of places that are also in the Bible that buttress this point. We can read from... Okay, uh, okay. okay. again, let's, let's do a little reading from Colossians, Colossians. 1, yeah, I think 15, yeah. Sorry. Uh, he talks about the preeminence of God. Jesus, the fact that he was there even before, and elsewhere the Bible calls talk, talk, uh, refer to him as a lamb that was, was slain, slain from, from the, the foundation, foundation of the world. So we we see that Jesus was in existence, just like John is telling us here. In the so beginning was the word. You are talking about immortality. Yeah. So to be God, you you have to be immortal. Yeah, you have to be immortal, mm. eternal. Mm. And uh, elsewhere, Paul puts it succinctly. He says, God only has immortality. Exactly. And that's why Jesus talks about laying down his life, 
Nobody took it from him. Mm. Because in him is life unborrowed. Mm. And that makes him God. Mm. Mm. That's quite um, deep. Well, if you have just joined the show, the show is Expectations on GTV Life, Your Religion and Culture Channel. And, you know, we have over the year 2016, we received a lot of comments and questions pertaining to, you know, you viewers actually were asking us whether Jesus is God. And guess what? We are treating that topic today and on the New Year's Eve. So we will quickly wrap up on that particular, you know, topic. And let me go back to Mr. Osekoku. Mr. Osekoku, you know, um, now that we have looked at, at, at the identity of Christ, okay, and what may constitute, you know, um, him being God, so how do we explain, if we met somebody in the streets and the person is challenging you here and there, how do we differentiate between his humanity and his divinity? Thank you very much. You, you uh, Looking at how his incarnation, we, we read from Matthew chapter 1 verse 8 to 25, how that the Holy Spirit came upon him. And the interesting thing about his incarnation is that all these things have been prophesied. He's, he's coming and the things that he was going to do, even his death. So in the beginning, in the first place, we know that he was supposed to have like a human father, but it's rather the Holy Spirit that brought about a conception. Mm. So that makes him even unique. In a sense, he was... Truly human and truly, and truly God. God. Because he came to live here. That's the mystery. Yeah. Identity. And that tells you when we say God is love, you just want to understand. Because he's so infinite, far removed, omnipotent, and omnipresent, and he becomes a man. You can't conceive of it. In fact, mm. it's, it's, mm. it's unfathomable. Mm. With mm. The, 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 mm. That is it. That's why when Paul looks at it, I think in Romans uh, 11 33, he says, The depth of the riches. Mm. Oh, and he, he, he exclaims, oh, the depth of the riches, both of the, the knowledge and wisdom of God, mm. that he should come. And I, I think we want to read something All in right. here, uh, right. Philippians read. chapter 2, okay. where we, we see the humility, how this incarnation comes about. Mm. Um, um, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, going, okay. um, we read that though he was God, Mm -hmm. He did not grasp onto this uh, his godliness, as it were, but emptied himself. Let's let uh, the Bible speak for says, Have this mind among yourself, which is also in Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God as a thing to be grasped or to be held onto, mm -hmm. but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, mm -hmm. being born in likeness of man, men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And the interesting part is that, therefore, when you go to 9, he says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow, bow and every tongue, tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. It's interesting that none of the angels in all created beings, mm -hmm they are not worthy of worship. So they do not accept worship. Mm. And that is where we see the evil one craving worship. Exactly. I mean, the, the Satan right from heaven. He wants mm. to be God. Be like the God. opposite of mm. what Jesus, the humility of Jesus that we see here. He said, I will send to the throne of heaven. I will be this. I, I, I. But Jesus rather hum humbles himself. So many times, Daniel envisions an angel. He wanted to bow down. Bow down the and the angel said, no, please Again, when you come to Revelation chapter 19 and Re Revelation chapter 22, mm -hmm. when jo John saw all those visions, he also attempted to bow down to, to, worship, to the worship the angels. But and the, the angels declined. said, no, maybe we want, to, we want to read that so that you okay, see. Briefly. But the fact yeah. that Jesus accepts worship and God himself has, has exalted him to be worshipped, mm -hmm. it tells mm -hmm. you that then he is God. Okay. Yeah. Okay. The angel actually forbade him from worshiping, worshiping. him. Okay. Yeah. Because he was also a man like 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 him, I mean he was the a creature, creature yeah. like him. Okay. That's like, and they actually use the word that like, I'm one of your brethren okay. and the, of the prophets. You know, John was at this point uh, being given uh, something for the people of God. So it's, in that sense, you call him the prophet because it was being mm -hmm. things were being revealed to him that was going to come in future. So the angel tells him not to worship him. But incidentally, we see Jesus rather receiving worship. Um, when he goes into the boat of uh, Peter, mm -hmm. and then he, Peter is so marveled by the catch of fish because they are, don't forget that they've been working throughout the night, they didn't catch even a single fish. Mm. He comes and says, Put it on the right, and straight away, 
the a horde of fish and the boat is even sinking. Mm -hmm. So Peter mm -hmm. actually falls down to worship him. He said, Depart from me, for I'm unclean. Elsewhere, when this uh the doubting man, Thomas, mm -hmm. had uh, refused to acknowledge that Jesus had resurrected unless he feels for himself, mm -hmm. he comes and then when he's, he sees Jesus, Jesus yes, is showing him, God. he said, yeah. my Lord and my God, and actually mm -hmm. worships him. And mm -hmm. Jesus do not forbid, forbid, for, them. forbid him from How about the, the, the lady at the rightly after resurrection, the lady that met Jesus? He was clinging on to him and he said, but he wasn't, he wasn't, uh, uh, he, not that he was denying or not accepting the worship okay. but he said he shouldn't detain him because he had to go he should not hold on to him because he had to go to the father okay so we, we see that jesus accepts worship mm. and one of the reasons why uh, anyone will want to accept worship and satan cannot accept worship in the we can read from revelations a lot it's all about um cre creation mm. if you read you are supposed to worship the Lord. Revelation 4.11. Okay. When we, re we read that, it says, Worthy are thou to receive honor, mm. glory, and power mm. because you created all things. And so maybe we can, we can read. Just to buttress that. what you just said, you know, in um, the entire book of Revelations, mm -hmm. it says this is the revelations of Jesus, Jesus Christ. Christ yeah. So if that particular text, like you just mentioned, mm -hmm. is saying that you are worthy uh, to receive worship, and the book of Revelations is talking about, you know, Jesus, then of course, then it must be that he is God. That is why he's worthy of worship, isn't it? Yeah. So verse 11 says, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and mm. honor and power. Okay. Why? For you created all things mm. and by your will, they exist and were created. Okay. So when we're talking about worship, we worship the creator, not creatures. Mm. And it, it is clear again in uh, chapter 11, verse 7, of the same book, Revelation. Okay. Verse 7, the word of God says, um, chapter, Revelation chapter 14, sorry, mm -hmm. verse um, 7, I read, it says, um, okay. there was an angel, let's mm -hmm. start from 6, and then I, saw an, an, I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having everlasting gospel, to preach to those who dwell on the earth. To every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. Seven says, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. Mm. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Mm. So worship is only to be given to a creator. And that's why in a smaller sense, when we come here, parents expect their children to serve them. Mm. Not to worship mm. them, but to serve them. Mm. So worship is only given to the creator. And we read, we read already read from... First John 1 to 3, that indeed God, the Son, He is the creator. He created. Mm. Because it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And all these things were created good. by the Word of God. All right, Mr. Sekoku, um, I guess we would we'll call it a day here on um, Expectations, this particular edition of Expectations. But before then, I'll take your final words on this particular topic. Is Jesus God? Your final okay. words on this. Yeah, I think early, early on, we talked about the attributes and nature of God. And we okay. see that Jesus also is eternal because he pre-existed. He's mm. holy. He's just. All the attributes that we, we can give to God that we talked about, Jesus has the same. Mm. And interestingly, he actually, one of the very famous uh, uh, tests, John 10.30, that he says, I and my father are one. one. He equates himself to the Father. And in fact, when it comes to John 14, he talks about the Father, he and the Father. Mm. The Father is in him and he is so also in the Father. the Father. And interestingly, the Jews pick up stones. They want to stone him. After saying that. After saying that. Said, so he said, so they, they I've done so many things. He said, yeah. said, said, I've done so many things. For what of the good words are you trying to So He said, for a good cause, we stone thee not. What? But you, a Demon, mere man, that's what they thought. Claiming to be God. Mm. When he said the father was in him and he was in the father, they understood that mm. he was equating himself to be the father. Right. So there are some people that say that Jesus never claimed to be God. This, actually these things, to. it is. Because it says, I and the father are one. Mm. And secondly, he said, the father is in me and I'm the father. And the Jews understood that by saying that he was equating himself so, with God. And they were ready to kill him for that, to, to stone him for that. So it, it's all clear that indeed. I guess, I guess we may have to, you know, do a part two for this particular topic. But... You viewers out there, we hope that you have enjoyed the discussions, but we are hoping that you could also send in your comments and questions 
for you know further clarity when we are able to get Mr. Sekwaku here in the studios again to discuss the same topic, a part two version of the same topic um, is Jesus God. So in fact, we want you to also enhance your comprehension on this particular topic. So we would like you to um, sit back and enjoy a sermon by Pastor Doc Bachelor, an international evangelist at the Amazing Facts in the United States of America. And we hope that it will enhance your comprehension further on this particular topic. Is Jesus God? When I think about how do you concentrate God into a baby? You can't wrap your mind around that. How you can fit all of God into a baby. For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Well, it's good to see each of you here. We're very thankful that you are worshiping God with us today. One way we do that, one of the most important ways we do that, is through the study of His Word. And really, the, the subject of Christ's first coming is one of the most uh, marvelous Bible studies in Scripture. And so we've titled the message for today, God with us. God with us. When you think about what that means, that God came into our world and entered the dominion where we exist and became one of us to reach us, uh, it is a marvelous thought. It's sometimes referred to as the truth of the incarnation. And the incarnation means incarne, carne, well you know what chili con carne is. <laughs> carne means with flesh. And God took on himself flesh of man and uh, came into our world, became one of us to save us. When I think about how do you concentrate God into a baby? You can't wrap your mind around that. How you can fit all of God into a baby. And yet that's what happened when Jesus came into our world. The Bible teaches that. Colossians 2 verse 9, For in Him dwells a particle of the fullness of God. That's not what it says. In Him dwells all of the fullness of God bodily. All the fullness of the Godhead bodily dwells in Christ. Now that's a marvelous thought when you think about it. You see, Jesus came into our world to reconcile us with God. There in the memory verse in Matthew 1, 23, Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son, and his name will be called Emmanuel, Emmanuel, which is translated God with us. To save us, God needed to come into our world and be with us. Now, I've got to back up and explain why this was necessary. We are separated from God because of sin. In Isaiah 59, 1, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor is his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. See, in the beginning, God didn't run from man. He wanted to be with man. He would walk with man in the cool of the day. But after man disobeyed, man ran from God. When we are separated from God, it's usually because we're clinging to sin. Micah 3 verse 4, Then they'll cry to the Lord, but He'll not hear them. He'll even hide His face from them at that time because of the evil in their deeds. Now, it's not that God doesn't want to be with us. He's not saying, well, you've been bad and so I'm leaving you. What happens is because of our sin, He is forced to separate Himself from us because the glory of God is so pure and so powerful and so perfect that if we were exposed to His unveiled glory, it would consume us. So to protect us, He separates. But He wants to be with us. So He developed a unique plan 
If I could become one of them, I can dwell with them to save them. But if God in His glory appears to us right now, we couldn't bear it. So we're restored through God the Son who became a man. Restoration comes through Jesus. Matthew 18 verse 12, the Lord says, What do you think? If a man has a hundred sheep and one of them goes astray, doesn't he leave the ninety and nine in the mountains and to go seek that one that is strain? That's really talking about our world. God has all these unfallen worlds out there and angels and he's left all them to come to this world to become one of us to save us because he wants to be with us. Ephesians 2.16 and that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross Jesus came to reconcile us to God therefore, therefore putting to death the enmity and he came and he preached peace to you who were far off and those who were near for through him both have access by one spirit to the Father so those that are separated are brought together by God now when you're thinking about this I always think about 2 Corinthians 5.19 that God was in Christ you might want to underscore that because I'm going to come back to that. That's going to be the central point we're talking about. God was in Christ, in Jesus, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. He doesn't give us credit for our sins because Jesus came to take them. He reconciles the world, not imputing their trespasses to them, and he's committed to them the word of reconciliation. Jesus really in his robe of righteousness sort of provides us with that radiation proof garment. You ever seen these people that are working in the nuclear labs? They're wearing these special suits that can resist both heat and radiation. Well the glory of God is like that radiation and Jesus through his death he provides us with these robes where we can survive and endure in the presence of a holy God. Now, have you ever thought, at what point did Jesus realize who he was? Have you ever wondered that? Well, I have too. I think it really began when he was 12 years old. If you are in the Gospel of Luke, this is the first time the red letters really appear. In Luke chapter 2, verse 49, when did Jesus first realize he was God's son? You remember when his parents took him to the temple? Kind of lost track of him. He was filled with amazement as he saw the Passover. Now when a Jewish boy got to be 12, he would begin attending the feast with his father. And he went and he was trying to take in the meaning of all this. He had read the scriptures. And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit began to talk to him and say, You are this lamb. And he began to realize what that mean. And it was a divine revelation that came to him. Now, this is the main point of what I want to say. Was Jesus God? John 5 verse 17 and 18 throughout the ministry of Jesus he was nearly stoned because his enemies understood he was claiming divinity now he was either mad or he was telling the truth but he did claim to be more than just a man he said my father has been working till now and I am working Therefore the Jews sought all the more to kill him, not only because they thought he broke the Sabbath, but that he said that his father was God, making himself equal with God. Now, they thought Jesus was making himself equal with God. Did he correct them? No. He allowed them to think that. Why? Because it's true. Jesus actually never came out. This is what throws people. You know, Jesus never came out anywhere and said, I am God. He never said it that way but he said it every other way so that we would study it and realize it. You, you know, you appreciate a treasure of truth when you study it. So he said things all around it. Here's another one. Christ referred to himself as the great I am. Now, you remember in the Old Testament in Exodus 3 when Moses said to God, Whom shall I say is sending me? And God answered and said, I am who I am. He said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. In other words, I'm not just one of the other gods. You know, the Egyptians, they had the gods of the rivers and the pagans, they had the gods of the trees and the bushes and the sun and the air and the wind and the rivers and all these different gods. 
And it's almost like he's saying, which God are you that I'll say? And he thought, boy, this is really mind-bending. He said, Moses, I am that I am. I am not a God of a certain territory. I am the self-existent eternal one that everything else is made out of. I am. That sort of sums it up. You tell me if you think it's just code how often Jesus used the I am to refer to himself. John 6.35 I am the bread of life. You got them up there on your screen. And it's not all that you'll find in the Bible. But notice the emphasis on I am. It's God who gives us that bread of life. Jesus is the word. John 8.12 I am the light of the world. John 10 verse 9 I am the door. John 10 verse 11, I am the Good Shepherd. John 10 36, this is as close as he comes to saying I am God. He says, I am the Son of God. John 11 25, I am the resurrection and the life. John 46, I am the way, the truth, truth and the life. John 15 verse 1, I am the true vine. All through the uh, New Testament, Jesus states himself as the great self-existent one. Then you go to John 10.30, got another story. Jesus said, I and my Father are one. The Jews took up stones again to stone him. Because here now Christ is quoting from where Moses said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And here Jesus is saying, I and the Father are one. He's not talking about oneness like a man and a wife in a marriage. He's saying we are one in the same. That word there in Greek means we are of the same essence. We are the same. I and my Father are one. The Jews knew what he was saying, and if you doubt it, notice. They took up stones to stone him. Jesus answered, For many good works I've shown you of my Father. For which of these do you stone me? Well, a perfect time for Christ to say, I didn't mean that. That's not what I meant, guys. Put the rocks down. He didn't correct them. He did mean what he said. For which of those do you stone me? The Jews answered, Because for good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy, because notice, you being a man, make yourself God. He didn't correct them, because he was God. Look at some of the criteria that defines God and see if Jesus meets those uh, criteria. For one thing, only God can forgive sin. Now you might offend me, and I can say I forgive you, but that's different than me forgiving your sins in general me forgiving sin in your life. I can't do that. Only God can forgive your record of sin. Do we all agree? And of course the verse is Isaiah 43, 25 I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for mine own sake and I'll not remember your sins. Mark 2 verse 5 Then Jesus saw their faith. He said to the paralytic Son, your sins are forgiven. And some of the scribes were sitting there and they reasoned in their hearts, why does this man speak blasphemies like this? Who can forgive sin but God alone? They were right theologically, only God can forgive sin. Could Jesus forgive sin? If only God can forgive sin, and if Jesus could forgive sin, then Jesus must be God. Amen. Does that make sense? Finish this verse for me. In the beginning, what did God do? He created the heavens and the earth. Now, was Jesus the creator? Colossians 1 verse 16, notice. For by him all things that are created, the speaking of Jesus, that are in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him. All things were created by him. And again, we all know in John 1 verse 3, all things were made through him. Without him was nothing made that was made. In the beginning God created. It says that God created, says Jesus created all things and Jesus must be God. You still with me? Does that make sense? Matthew 4 verse 10, for it is written, Jesus even quoted this to Satan, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. The only one who deserves our worship is God. It is a sin to worship a man or even an angel. You can read in Revelation 19 verse 10, 
when John is having the vision of Revelation, this angel, this powerful angel is sent and he's so overwhelmed with the power and the glory of this angel, he falls down to worship the angel. What does the angel say? I fell at his feet to worship him, but he said, See that you do not do that. You're sinning right up here in a heavenly vision. Don't worship me. I am of your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. Only to worship God. But even the angels worship Jesus. Pretty plain, Hebrews 1 6. But when again he brings his firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of God worship him. When the angels sang at the birth of Christ to the shepherds, they were worshiping Christ. So if the Bible says you're to only worship God, and if we're told to worship Jesus, then Jesus must be God. Is the evidence mounting, friends? It tells us that God is our judge in the Bible. 1 Samuel 2 verse 10, The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. All will sit before the judgment seat of God, Paul said. Psalm 98 verse 8 and 9, Let the rivers clap their hands, let the hills be joyful together before the Lord, for He is coming to judge the earth with righteousness. He will judge the world and the people with equity. Now what does it say about Jesus? John 5, 22, For the Father judges no one. So this God that's going to be doing the judging in the last days, and Jesus is the Father judges no one, but has committed all, how much? All judgment to the Son. If it says that God is our judge, and God the Father is judging no one, and all judgment is done by God the Son, is Jesus God? Don't ever be ashamed about that. Uh, don't ever be hesitant about that. That's what makes the event of his birth so unique. He wasn't just a child with a bright future. He wasn't just a very intelligent speaker. You know, this is the point that chokes much of the world. If you go and you listen to the news commentators talk, or you watch some program from History or Discover or National Geographic about Jesus, they say, he was a very intriguing teacher. He was a very a profound speaker. He was captivating, great communicator, knew how to simplify things. They have no problem admitting he lived, they have no problem talking about the wonderful job he did teaching, how he moved people, what a unique individual he was, what an extraordinary character, what an interesting person. But when you say, well, you know, he was God, that's where they gag. That's where they choke. That's where they get nervous and restless. Because that's, that's different than just an interesting person. I've got a lot of Jewish family. And I said, what do you think of Jesus? Oh, he was a good man. He was a prophet. He was a good, good man. You can talk to Muslims around the world. Oh, Jesus was a prophet. Good man. Now, what's the problem for me is, how can you say that you believe that Jesus was a prophet, and when he says, I'm the Messiah, you say, well, that's the one place where that prophet lied. If you believe he's a prophet, then believe what he said. And he said, I am the Son of God. Amen. And so that's why we mustn't lose sight of this truth. He wasn't just an interesting per person. The birth of Christ is the event that transcends every other human birth in history. Because ultimately we're all created by God. But here you have the Creator becoming the creation to save the creation. Revelation 1.8 Christ said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and was and is to come, the Almighty. Here's the Lord speaking. He says, I am the Almighty. All through the Bible, whenever you talk about or read about the Almighty God, His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. That's Jesus. The Almighty God, Jehovah, entered into this baby. When we read John 3.16, and it talks about the only begotten Son. We all know that verse. For God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him might not perish, but have everlasting life. So why is Jesus called the only begotten 
What does that mean in that phrase? That word begotten there means the only time that God was born as a man. When did Jesus become the only begotten Son of God? It was when He was born into our world. He was always the Son of God. They always had this relationship that you and I can't understand. And the closest terms that God can give us for you and I to relate to is the powerful love between a father or a mother even and their child. And there seems to be a staggering authority between God the Father and God the Son, but they're all their God in the Spirit. Only begotten Son is the only time that God was born as a human, is what that's saying, was in Jesus. But He was God, always, all the time, had always existed. You know, this is a mystery. 1 Timothy 3.16, I like John 3.16, 1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Who was manifest? When Jesus came into, when God came into a, a human form, how that all happened is a mystery. God was manifest in the flesh. Justified in the spirit, he lived a righteous life, seen by angels, preached among the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. It was God that came into our world. This is, uh, this is so amazing. And you know why He did it? Because He wants us to live and He wants to be with us in eternity. You know, in the beginning of the Bible, it tells how through sin, man was separated from God. Then God had a plan. He sent His Son. In the end of the Bible it says, and God himself will be with them. Now call his name Emmanuel, God with us. We are separated from God now. Does God love us less than any man loves his bride or bride her groom? How much does he want to be with us? He yearns for it so much that he made an emergency trip to this world. He actually decided, I am going to separate myself from my heavenly Father and the angels and glory and my kingdom, come into this sinful dark world, and you have no idea how dark it is unless you've seen glory, to become one of them, to save them, so that they can be back with me again. The whole idea is that we can be with him. He was with us so we could be with him. You know, there's a, uh, an interesting story. It actually goes back a number of years. I think it was in 1991 or something that this uh, young lady, Anissa Alyaya of Los Angeles, had leukemia and she needed a bone marrow transplant to save her from leukemia. Now her parents were 44 and 42 and uh, dad had a little procedure to ensure they weren't going to have any more children. Their brother did not have the blood type. Neither parent had the right blood type for a match for a bone marrow. Her only chance of life, it was chronic, she was going to die unless she got this bone marrow transplant. So the parents, in desperation, they did a real Hail Mary, pardon the pun. Long shot. The dad had a surgery to reverse his vasectomy. They had a baby with a uh, less than 25% chance that baby would have the right blood type. The baby did have the right blood type. They gave birth to a little girl named Marissa. Her older sister is Anissa. And uh, they waited till she was eight months old and then they did the bone marrow transplant and it took. And her sister lived and she lives a very productive, healthy life. They basically had a baby to save their daughter. Now this created all kinds of moral questions that uh, people were analyzing, but for the parents they said it was never a question for us. If it was the only way that we could save our daughter was by having a baby, we were going to love them both. Amen. And, uh, and so it's interesting, you, you hear the two girls are very close. Matter of fact, the older one kind of mothers the younger one and she says, you know, if it wasn't for my younger sister uh, I wouldn't be alive. And then she also says, and if it wasn't for me, she wouldn't be alive. <laughs> <laughs> Had
having a baby to give life. But you know, that's the essence of the gospel. The Lord loves us so much that He gave that we might have new life. And He gave the biggest thing anyone could give is their life. I read one time about a pastor that did some research and he came to the conclusion there are over 300 references to the second coming of Jesus in the Bible. Obviously, if the return of Christ is such a priority with God, it should be among his followers. We need to know that Jesus is coming, that he's coming soon, and something about how he's coming, because the Bible says the devil is going to attempt to impersonate Christ's return. We need to know the difference. That's why we've prepared this special study guide for you called The Ultimate Deliverance. If you'd like a copy of this free study guide, just go to the web address on your screen, it's amazingfacts.org, or call the phone number and ask for offer number 105. We'll send it to you right away. I can promise you, you'll never be the same, and you will be encouraged and comforted by this study. Stay tuned. Pastor Doug will be right back with this week's special free offer. Deep within the pages of the Bible, stories of great heroes, heroes of great deeds, great love, and great sacrifice. But behind them is another hero, hidden in plain sight amid the shadows. He was there from the beginning, and he'll be there until the end. Discover the golden thread of a savior woven throughout the entire Bible tapestry. Shadows of Light. Seeing Jesus in all the Bible. A new book by Doug Batchelor. Get your copy today by calling 800-538-7275 or visit afbookstore.com. Once again, to purchase your copy of Shadows of Light, call 800-538-7275. Can't get enough Amazing Facts Bible Study? You don't have to wait until next week to enjoy more truth-filled programming. Watch Amazing Facts Television by visiting AFTV.org. At AFTV.org, you can view Amazing Facts programming 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, right from your computer or mobile device. Why wait a week? Visit AFTV.org. It's that easy. For life-changing Christian resources, visit afbookstore.com. Expectations is a Christian program that discusses a number of issues, including your health, choosing to be single and living a fulfilled life, issues of marriage and how your marriage life can have a resemblance of good traits of heaven, such as joy, peace, and love. End-time events are also not left out. The passage of homosexuality into law in America, terrorist attacks, war, corruption, disease, and hunger. There are poetry recitals. There is only the phantom from drama who hears the drum louder. Pam, pam, serenda. Song ministrations and movies. Expectations is simply about how it all began, how it's all going to end. Expectations. Jesus is on his way. Who was Jesus? Was he a liar? Was he a lunatic? Or was he the Lord? For over 40 years, Amazing Facts has been dedicated to sharing God's Word through media. This program features highlights from some of our best television broadcasts. We invite you to sit back and enjoy this edition of Amazing Facts Presents. Our message this morning probably could be classified as important as anything I could talk about. Because I'm reminded as every now and then I mingle with the people in our culture that a lot of folks, while they may hear the name of Jesus from time to time, they really have no idea who Jesus is. And I thought it would be uh, valuable and appropriate to talk a little bit. And sometimes we need reminding about that subject, who is Jesus? I wasn't sure how to title the sermon, 
because when you say who is Jesus, it sounds like he's present tense, and some people think you should title it who was Jesus, but either way you word it, people want to know who is he? Where did he come from? Somebody wrote this beautiful passage one time where they said, uh, all the armies that have ever marched and all the navies that have ever sailed, all the parliaments that have ever sat and all the kings that have ever reigned, put together have not affected life upon earth as powerfully as this one solitary life. When you think about the way that Jesus was born in comparative obscurity, and he never did all the typical things that usually denote greatness. He never led an army into battle. He never led a navy. It doesn't tell us that he ever wrote a book. He didn't do any of the things that uh, you typically think of with greatness. We don't know what he looked like. There's a lot of artist renditions of what Jesus looked like, but there's nothing contemporary from his day. And yet he changed all of history. It's while we're talking about history, you've got A.D. and B.C. And they use new terms today, but we used to call that before Christ and after death or the year of our Lord. All of history is dated from his birth. So how can you doubt that he lived? If you look in the encyclopedia, it doesn't cast any doubt on whether or not he lived. So we know he lived. The real question you've got to decide, was he a liar? Was he a lunatic? Or was he the Lord? Who was Jesus? Did God come to our earth in the form of a man to save us? Oh, I want to read something first by A.W. Tozer. He said, Christ is not one of many ways to approach God. He's not the best of several ways. He is the only way. Anyone who comes to God must come through Christ. And while Buddha may have said a number of profound things, and you might have some profound sayings from uh, Krishna and Muhammad and the different religions of the world, nobody spoke like Jesus, and none of them died as a sacrifice for the sins of the world. There's something very clearly di different about Jesus. Jesus is the only redeemer with God. He is the only mediator with God. Christ is the bridge between heaven and earth. Jesus said to Nathaniel, hereafter you will see the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. None of the other religious leaders of the world say, I am the way, the truth, and the life to God. He didn't say, I'm one of the ways. He said, I am the way. He didn't say, I'm one of the truths. All rivers lead to the ocean. I'm just one of them. He said, I am the truth. I am the life. So why did Jesus come? So where do we look to get the information for this? There are over 300 Old Testament prophecies that talk about what to expect when the Messiah comes. Three, we're not going to look at all 300, but we're going to look at some basic categories to find out who is Jesus. Um, especially, you'll find a lot in the Psalms. Over 300 Old Testament prophecies reference the anointed. First prophecy you're going to find in the Bible regarding the Messiah coming is actually in Genesis 3.15. We'll put that on the screen. Here it says when God was speaking to um, Adam and Eve after the fall, he said, I will put enmity, that's similar to the word enemy, it means there's animosity, there's friction, there's an adversarial relationship between thee and the woman. He was talking to the serpent. Between your seed and her seed. The seed of the woman, talking about this promised seed that was going to come through humanity, was the Messiah. He, the seed of the woman, will bruise your head. God says to the serpent or the devil that the seed of the woman, Christ, would bruise your head, a mortal wound to the head, and you will bruise his heel. You will impede his progress or slow his walk down. So this first prophecy is found right there in Genesis chapter 3. They were looking for a savior, the seed of the woman that would come, that would defeat the serpent that caused the fall of man and the loss of paradise. Through Christ, paradise is restored. So let's look at some of those uh, prophecies. For one thing, in uh, John 1, verse 45, after Philip found Jesus, he then goes and he tells Nathanael, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. He said, Moses and the prophets and the law all talked about this man. It all pointed to this one individual. Where did Jesus come from? Now we alluded to that there in John chapter 8, but let's look at some other verses. 
John 19, verse 8, matter of fact, Pontius Pilate, during the trial of Jesus, he asked that very question, where are you from? Where did you come from? Jesus said in John 6, verse 38, for I have come down from heaven. Now, if I said that to you, you'd probably ask me to get some counseling. So, or, you, you know, there are people out there that would think that I snuck away from Area 51 in Nevada. I was an alien. But Jesus wasn't talking about being an extraterrestrial. He was saying he came from the Father. He made that very clear. And we read just a moment ago, he said, I'm going back to the Father. This is a messenger. And when you talk about the Father, we're not talking about a God of a certain solar system or a certain galaxy. Biblically, when you're talking about the Father, you're talking about the God of everything. Think about the immensity of space and how big God must be, how awesome God is. And when Jesus says that I made all that and I am the Son of God and I've come from God, wow, that's a pretty bold claim. That's a pretty amazing claim that He came from God. Again, Jesus answered and said, My kingdom is not of this world. He told Pilate, If my kingdom was of this world, then would my citizens fight. But my kingdom is not now of this world. Did Jesus claim to be God? Did he claim divinity? Is he just another man? Or was he the commingling of the divine and human? John 8, verse 58. Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. You remember when Moses was talking to God at the burning bush and he said, So exactly which God are you? What's your name? What shall I say to the people of Israel, who, who are you that you are sending me? Do you have a business card? How did God introduce himself to Moses? He said, I am that I am. It's not that I once was or I will be. The phrase I am means I am everlasting to everlasting. I am the self-existent one. I am eternal. Christ was claiming to be God and to be eternal. It says there would be something unique about his birth. Now, everybody alive was born at some point. But Jesus was born in a very unique way. And a prophecy told this was going to happen 500 years before the event. Isaiah 7, 14. The Lord will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will conceive and bear a son. And you will call his name Emmanuel. Now, that doesn't happen very often, does it? Was Jesus born of a virgin? Doesn't it say that? You can read the next verse here in... Um, Matthew chapter 1 verse 18, now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. After his mother Mary was betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, and this was not some laboratory insemination. It said that the Holy Spirit would overshadow her. Before Joseph and Mary came together, she was found to be with child of the Holy Spirit. And God said that, that would happen. The Bible records that it did happen. The place of his birth is identified. Now you're getting very specific because it's going to mention the town of Bethlehem. And you can read this passage in um, Micah chapter 5 verse 2. He interrogated the scribes and he said, Where is the Messiah supposed to be born? And they said, We know exactly where he's supposed to be born. He's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. And so there was no question about that. Bethlehem, there are actually two towns in Israel called Bethlehem. I don't know how many there are, but I know there are scores of towns in North America called Farmington. You know what I'm talking about? There's a lot, some towns that uh, have very common names you can find all over North America. I think we've got a few James towns. And uh, you've got a few towns called Paris. There's Paris, Maine. There's a Paris, Texas. I don't know why you'd come to America and name anything Paris. But anyway, they did. Well, in the promise, and the word Bethlehem means house of bread. And there were a couple of Bethlehems. But you notice it specifies the Bethlehem where Rachel died giving birth to Benjamin, which was Bethlehem Ephrathah, which is just outside Jerusalem. So this prophecy in Micah not only tells what town, it delineates specifically which Bethlehem Jesus was going to come from. As a matter of fact, it was so clear that when King Herod saw the wise men coming, he interrogated the scribes and he said, where is the Messiah supposed to be born? And they said, we know exactly where he's supposed to be born. He's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. And so there was no question about that. 
Now there's a very interesting prophecy. This really could be a, a prophecy that also tells the time of his birth. In Matthew, I'm sorry, in Daniel chapter 9, Daniel 9 verse 25, there's a prophecy. It's the 490 year prophecy. Part of that prophecy is called the 483 year segment. And that's where it says in verse 25, No one understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, which was given in 457 B.C. by King Ahasuerus, unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and threescore in two weeks. So it's actually the decree of Art Artaxerxes. I was getting Esther mixed up with Nehemiah. King Artaxerxes in 457 B.C. gave that decree. Seven weeks in Jewish prophecy, a day equals a year. Now you'll see a few references for this. Ezekiel 4.6, I've appointed you each day for a year. You can also read that principle in Numbers 14.35, even the words of Jesus. In a parable he tells in Luke 13.32, he makes it clear that in a prophecy you use the principle of a day for a year. So when you go and you add up the time period here in Daniel where he says seven weeks and 62 weeks, seven plus 62 is how much? 69. 69, a week has got how many days? A week has how many days? I gave you an easy one. Come on, help me. <laughs> Seven days. So you add that up and you've got 483 years. 69 weeks, 483 days. A day is a year, 483 years. If you count from the start of the uh, decree to rebuild Jerusalem, 457 B.C., given by Artaxerxes, and then you go 483 prophetic years, or regular years, to AD 27. That's exactly when Jesus was baptized. And you can read about that in John 1. When Jesus came to the Jordan River, he knew his time had come. And right at his 30th birthday, he was baptized. John the Baptist said, he saw Jesus coming. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Jesus was that Lamb that they had been looking for. Abraham said to Isaac, when Isaac said, Lord, our father, we've got the wood, we've got the fire, but where is the sacrifice? Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. Finally, they're all looking for the lamb of God, the anointed, the Messiah. John says, there he is. This is the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. This is the seed of the woman. This is the one that we've been looking for all this time. And he identified him several times. And that's why Philip and Peter and Nathaniel all began to follow him then because he had been flagged by John the Baptist as the Lamb of God. Now I told you, <clears throat> you could actually figure from Daniel's prophecy when Jesus was born. By the way, there were a couple that were looking for his birth, maybe because of Daniel's prophecy, because they knew that it was going to be 483 years from the command to rebuild Jerusalem until the Messiah was anointed and began his ministry they could understand that a priest could not begin to teach until he was 30. King David did not begin to reign until he was 30. Joseph went out to administrate over Egypt when he was 30. So all they had to do was count back 30 years from AD 27 and find the birth of Christ around 4 BC. So even from that same prophecy you could have calculated about the time of his birth. So this prophecy is it told when he would be born and what did it say would happen? he would be anointed. You can read there in Acts chapter 10 verse 38 how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil for God was with him. When Jesus was baptized the Holy Spirit came down and he was anointed with the Holy Spirit. He was the anointed. You don't hear about the miracles of Jesus unless you're reading something apocryphal. You don't read about the miracles of Jesus before he was 30. For the first 30 years of his life, he lived as a man among men, just as you and I do. And then he was anointed at his baptism. He began his public ministry, turned the world upside down in three and a half years. And then uh, that would be part of that 490-year um, prophecy. And then it tells the nature of his ministry. Matter of fact, Jesus quotes these very words in Nazareth when he began his ministry. Isaiah 61 verse 1. Christ stood up in the synagogue of Nazareth, his hometown church in Galilee. And he said, The Lord, the Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he has anointed me. He is the anointed. To preach the good tidings to the meek. 
he sent me to bind the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. Furthermore, it tells us that he would speak and teach in parables. King David said in Psalm 78, I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old, which we have heard and known, and our fathers have told us. Regarding Christ, it said that um, he, sp he spoke and he taught them in parables. Without a parable, he didn't say anything. He often taught in allegories and illustrations. And those that heard him talk say, Never, ever did a man speak like this man. There's no man that could teach like Jesus. People who went to arrest him came back and said, Wow, nobody speaks like this man. It goes on and it tells us about his betrayal. For instance, Psalm 41 verse 9, Even my own familiar friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Did Jesus eat a meal with bread with Judas? And Judas walked right out that door and went to the priests and then led them to Christ. It gives us even more detail about the betrayal of Jesus. Zechariah 11, verse 12 and 13. Then I said to them, If it is agreeable to you, give me my wages, and if not, refrain. So they weighed out for my wages 30 pieces of silver. Not only tells that he was sold for the price of a slave, it tells what kind of metal. It could have been copper, it could have been gold, it could have been bronze or silver. It says it was silver. So it tells how many pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, that princely sum. And they set on me. So they took 30 pieces of silver and threw them into the house of the Lord for the potter. Now, I don't have time to read it all, but all the verses are in Matthew 27, verse 3 to 7. You can look that up. Matthew 27, 3 to 7. It tells how during the trial of Christ, Judas, overwhelmed with a sense of guilt. You know, once the devil had used him, he didn't need Judas anymore. And Judas, finally realizing what he had done, came to his senses. He betrayed the Son of God, and they were preparing to crucify him. He just was crushed by a sense of his guilt. He went into the uh, outskirts of the temple where he was being tried. The Sanhedrin was meeting. He said, I betrayed innocent blood. He threw down the 30 pieces of silver. They didn't want to take it because it was blood money, they called it. So they bought a potter's field to bury strangers in with the money. That's all in the New Testament. You, you know, I don't know if I'm... Let me just say something here at the outset just to give you an idea. All right. Here we've got, I've got the book of Matthew. Here's the New Testament. This is the Old Testament. Old Testament, of course, starts with Moses. New Testament doesn't begin until the birth of Jesus. These prophecies I'm reading to you about the Messiah, they come from the Old Testament. Not only do they come from the Old Testament, even though there's no page here, there ought to be a page in your Bible that says 400 years. One page, it just says 400 years, silence. There are 400 years between all these prophecies and when Jesus finally comes. That prophecy I just read to you from Zechariah, they couldn't have concocted and made that up. 400 years went by. We know from the Dead Sea Scrolls that these things were written before Jesus was born. How could you fabricate? How could you counterfeit? How could you manufacture that that prophecy would be fulfilled, that Jesus would be betrayed by a friend who ate bread with him for 30 pieces of silver, who would then throw it to the potter's field in the house of the Lord? I mean, that's just one of thousands. Oh, actually 300. I got carried away. Prophecies, there might be more, but someone counted 300 and I believe it. Tells about the manner of his death. Now this is an incredible prophecy. You read in Psalm 22, The congregation of the wicked has enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. They divided my garments among them. For my low clothing they cast lots. This is prophesied nearly 800 years before Jesus was born. How could you know that? And that's all in that one psalm. And there are many psalms. Psalm 34. He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. They broke the bones of the thief on the right and the left of Jesus because Jesus was the Passover lamb and they were never to break the bones of the Passover lamb. They didn't break any of his bones. Just as the prophecy had said, he guards my bones. Jesus also claimed to be the son of God. Not in the sense that we are all sons of God, but in the unique sense that he is the only begotten son of God. And he claimed to have the prerogatives or the powers of the divine. He claimed to be God. 
Now, those are some pretty bold claims. What are you going to do with what Jesus says about himself? C.S. Lewis puts it this way, A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said wouldn't be a great moral teacher. He'd be a lunatic on the level of a man who says he's a poached egg. Or else he'd be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the Son of God or else he's a madman or something worse. Someone else put it this way, Christ was either a conscious deceiver, deluded, or divine. He is either lunatic, liar, or Lord. There is no escaping one of these three options. You know, there's three principal reasons that Jesus came. First, He came to be our example. He says in John 13, 5, sorry, John 13, 15, For I've given you an example that you should do as I have done. Part of the reason Jesus lived for 33 and a half years among men is He said, I want to show you how to live, how to love each other, how to forgive. I'm not just going to tell you to turn the other cheek. I'm going to show you how it's done. And He did, didn't He? When He went through His trial, I'm going to show you how to love and forgive each other the way He forgave. He came, point number two, to reveal the Father. This world is very confused about who God is. You know, I've, I don't know why it is that as I intermingle with people, I hear Jesus' name being used in profanity so frequently. I've never heard people get mad, hit their finger with a hammer and say, Oh, Buddha. I don't hear them cite Muhammad's name or Allah or Krishna. Why is it this is diabolical focus to especially scorn the name of Jesus? That in itself ought to tell you there's a spiritual battle out there. The world doesn't know who the Father is. Jesus came to show us what the Father is like. He said, Have I been with you so long and you don't know me, Philip? He that has seen me has seen the Father. By the way, that's John 14, 9. And then most importantly, Jesus came to trade places with us. We are all under a death sentence because of our sin and our selfishness. And Christ does not want to lose us. He loves us. And he said, I will come. I will take the penalty for your sin. I'll not only take it, I will give you my strength and power. I am going to be your substitute. I will trade places with you. He said, I will give you my goodness and I'll take your badness. I will give you my strength and I'll take your weakness. I will give you my life and I will take your death. I will give you my peace and I will take your sufferings and your misery. He's offering that all as a gift that we receive by faith. But you need to believe that He is who He said He is. Do you know Him, friends? Have you accepted Him? You can right now. His, exa his example, Martin Luther said, in his life is showing us how to live. In His death, He is a sacrifice, satisfying for our sins. In His resurrection, He is a conqueror. In His ascension, He is a king. In His intercession, He is a priest. He is everything that we need. In the volume of the book, it is written of Him. When we see Abraham going up the hill with Isaac, we see Jesus. When we see Moses leading a nation from slavery, we see Jesus. When we see Joseph forgiving his brothers for mistreating him, we see Jesus. We see Jesus in Samson when he stretches out his arms to defeat the enemies of God's people. We see Jesus in Gideon defeating the enemy with this small group. All through the Bible, I see Jesus everywhere. This is all about Him. He wants you to know who He is. God became a man, and His name was Jesus. Do you know Him? You need to know Him, because knowing Him is everlasting life. Stay tuned. Pastor Doug will be right back. Expectations is a Christian program that discusses a number of issues, including your health, choosing to be single and living a fulfilled life, issues of marriage and how your marriage life can have a resemblance of good traits of heaven, such as joy, peace, and love. End time events are also not left out. The passage of homosexuality into law in America, terrorist attacks, war, corruption, disease, and hunger. There are poetry recitals. There is only the phantom from drama who hears the drum louder. Pam, pam, serenda. Song ministrations and movies. Expectations is simply about how it all began. How it's all going to end. 
Trump's petitions, she says is on its way. Now, you know, a person can't have really any security or happiness unless they understand some basics. And one is what you're doing here, where you're going, but at the very foundation is where did you come from? We need to know something about where we came from in order to have any kind of peace of mind about what we're doing here and where we're going. So origins are foundational to life. Knowing something about where we came from. It's amazing how much energy and uh, investment humanity is putting right now into the subject of understanding the universe and where we came from. I think I've actually got some pictures of it. The most expensive experiment man has ever engaged in is in Europe. It's called the Large Hadron Collider. And this is the world's largest high energy, it's even not, it's called the highest energy particle accelerator and it's the most expensive scientific instrument ever built and um, you can find it in Europe it's on the borders between Switzerland and France it's a tunnel that was built and the tunnel is between 160 and 574 feet below the surface because the surface varies and the tunnel is 17 miles in depth that means that tunnel is like longer than what it would take to get from uh, here to Lincoln it's one circle and it's for an experiment underground and uh, it's for colliding various particles and they're they're trying to find what they call the God particle how many of you have heard about this you know they're, they're trying to of course they have no electron microscope they can see anything that small so what they do is they collide these different particles under different uh, scientific environments and look at how things around them react and evaluate the information by the, the shadows really of the reaction and trying to figure out how matter interacts because you know one of the laws of science is that matter does not create itself that all of the matter that exists in the universe today has always existed that you cannot add to it you cannot take from it you can maybe make it go through transitions but matter does not create itself and so they're trying to figure out the origins of the universe through these experiments but um, there's one thing that uh, they don't understand and that is that there's a lot they don't understand um, think about how much man has learned in the last hundred years think about how much man has learned in the last 500 years about the size of the universe for one thing uh, you know man used to think they could count all the stars and there are about 5113 stars well now we know that there's billions of stars out there and there's billions of galaxies that are fiery pinwheels full of stars we just learned that in a short period of time right now we think we're very smart because I mean haven't we achieved a lot with computers but look at how much we've learned about computers in 20 years do any of you still have a floppy drive do we all remember when we thought that 20 megabytes would be more space than you would ever possibly need in one lifetime some of you remember that and then they went to the little the disk drives and and then they went to the you know the CDs and the DVDs and the double layer DVDs and now you can put all of that on a stick drive and and the technology just in 20 years has just exploded and we think we know about the secrets of the universe now uh, there's so much we don't know God the Bible says can speak things into existence you know I didn't even get to our memory verse uh, memory verse is Genesis 1:1. I think most of you know that by heart. Let's all say it backwards. No. <laughs> Genesis 1 1. You ready? Say it with me. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Uh, I, I guess I'm simple enough to say I still believe that. Amen. I think God made everything. Now, I, I should mention at this point, I didn't used to always believe that. I was raised pretty much believing in evolution, well, very much believing in it. I was either depending on what year it was I was either agnostic or atheist I guess it depended on who I was talking to but um, 
I was quite certain that everything around us evolved. The idea that God could speak things into existence to me was the stuff of cartoons and fables and fantasy and science fiction. And not even science, it was just fiction. And so I, I never would have dreamed that the more educated I became and the older I got that I'd ever come to believe in this. But uh, I do now. I believe it's the only logical scientific explanation for all of the organization and design and inner working systems that we see in the world around us today. So under the first section, as a matter of fact, we still are going to have um, some of you participate in reading verses with me. And the first verse is Hebrews 11.3. Now who has that? And hold your hand up if you got that uh, verse. It's over here. We've got microphones on both sides. Hold your hand up so that our microphone courier can see you. And uh, we'll have another one. Matter of fact, someone has Psalm 19, 1 to 3. Who has that? That's over here. We'll get you set up for the next time. Now, just before we go to Hebrews, I'm going to read Romans 4, 17. Can God bring things into existence? Romans 4, 17. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him who believed. God, notice, God who gives life to the dead, he can bring dead things to life, and calls those things that do not exist as though they did. Here he's referring to Abraham. And God said to Abraham, you know, he's a hundred years old and he's got no children. He calls him father of many nations, father of a multitude. He was calling that which didn't exist as though it did. And it looked pretty unlikely that it could happen. What was the likelihood that that old man and that old woman would have a brand spanking new baby? God spoke it through his promise into existence. God can work miracles by his word. All right, read for me, please, Hebrews 11:3. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. The things that we see were not made of things that do appear. God is able to bring things into existence out of nothing. And how he does that, we don't know. But and we'll talk a little more about that. By the way, it says, through faith we believe this. And so when someone talks to you about the origin of the world, and they say, how do you think things came into existence? You say, I believe God spoke, and there it was. And they'll say, well... Isn't that, where do you get that? I believe it because it's in the Bible. You mean you just believe it because it's in the Bible? Well, that would be enough. But you know, faith is not based on nothing. You know, my faith in the Bible is not based on someone just pointing at me and shaking their fist and finger and saying, believe. My faith in the Bible is based on evidence. I don't, I, you know, why do you believe in the Bible? Because my parents and my pastor tell me I must pretty weak argument. Uh, the reason I believe the Bible is because of other evidence in the Bible that the entire book is dependable. There are some things the Bible says that I can't explain, but there are so many other things in the Bible that have been proven that I believe it as a whole. That it's the Word of God. For me, what did it for me? Well, let me see if I could illustrate. Just use your imagination. I've done this before, but some of you haven't heard it. Just suppose right now that I should say to you that I had this uncanny ability to snap my fingers and disappear, become invisible. Now, how many of you believe me? Just as I expected. Nobody believed me. Where's your faith? You don't have faith. All right, now use your imagination. Just suppose that I snap my fingers and Pastor Doug is gone. Close your eyes. I've disappeared. Close your eyes. Okay, you don't see me anymore. I've disappeared. <laughs> so just really pretend I did disappear. Would you be impressed? How many would you be scared? How many of you would look to your right and left and go, what in the world just happened? Wouldn't it, wouldn't it just kind of freak you out a little bit? All right, and then you hear, and I appear again. All right, I just did that. You think that's pretty amazing, don't you? Some of you are thinking I'm messing with the occult, right? You're wondering how that happened or witchcraft or some magician. And then let's suppose I tell you, did you all know that I know how to flap my arms vigorously like a chicken and I can hover around the room? How many of you believe I can do that? Now I just disappeared, right? Just pretend I just disappeared. Now I'm telling you I can flap my arms and hover around the room. Does anyone here believe me now? 
A few of you say, well, you know, he just did the impossible. You know, all right, now let's suppose you see me. And I go, <laughs> and I start to hover around the room. Use your imagination. All right, would you be impressed? You'd think I was borderline angelic or something, right? All right, and then I, whew, I've just come back down. Now you're thinking, wow, that's pretty amazing. Now if I told you I could multiply two pieces of tofu and five loaves into enough to feed us all at potluck, how many of you would believe me? Let me see your hands. Now I just flew around the room. You see what I'm saying? Eventually, if I did enough incredible things, then you take my word for the other things you hadn't seen yet because I've given you evidence. See what I'm saying? So I don't know how Jesus can speak things into existence, but I know that prophecies in the Bible that were foretold came true. I know that the Word of God changes people's lives. I know that the outline for the existence of things in the world given by the Bible makes sense. You know, this probably won't be as relevant when it airs in three weeks, but we need to be praying in a special way for those families back in Connecticut that are reeling from this uh, senseless massacre of children and, and the teachers. And then yesterday afternoon, I saw on the news, I was online, and um, the news reporters were asking two pastors, how do you explain God being love with things like this happening? Why would God allow this to happen? And I thought, okay, pastors, you have a chance now. Let me hear what you're going to say. It was really, pardon me, but it was pathetic. They just could not give a Bible explanation for why there is evil in the world and why these things happen. And I thought I was kind of stomping around telling Karen and Nathan, I thought, oh, I wish I had the microphone. Not that you can explain all the answers for why there's evil in the world, why bad things happen, but I think in the Bible we have a scenario that we understand there is a battle between good and evil. Why does anything, if God is just going to make only good things happen, then why does anything evil happen, right? And there's, there's a scheme, there's a system, there's a scenario, there's an explanation in the Bible that makes sense of what's going on in the world for me. And so many people don't understand it. Even pastors and Christians don't understand the great controversy that there's a war, that this planet's been invaded by an enemy. The Bible gives us a system that makes sense. And um, so I believe the things that I can't explain. Everywhere you look, you can see evidence for God's creative power. Matter of fact, uh, we're going to go next to Psalm 19. Are we still ready? Psalm 19, verse 1 to 3. And why don't you read that for us? The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows His handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. That means, of course, around the world as it rotates in space in whatever direction they look, they see the starry heavens, the infinite starry heavens, and the very infinite nature of the heavens and you realize that when King David wrote this, the atmosphere was a little cleaner than it is now, a little clearer, and they could see a little better. Um, and you see, the wonders in heaven. Now we know what we used to think were stars or galaxies, like I said, with billions of suns, and it just goes on forever and ever. I remember when um, Karen and I went to Australia, and we spent the night, I guess we spent a couple nights out on a boat there in the, um, uh, by the Great Barrier Reef. And we looked up at night and it was very weird because I was looking at a sky I had never seen before. You know, I, you're used to looking up and seeing the, the array of stars that we have here in the Northern Hemisphere and you can spot some of the familiar constellations. But I suddenly looked up and I thought, this is a whole different heaven that I've never seen before. So everyone in the world that looks up, you can see the things of God in heaven. And the closer you look through a telescope at the things that God made, the more infinite we realize He is. We've all been wowed by the pictures that have come back from the Hubble telescope. Now they're building a telescope, the James Webb telescope, that's got a collecting mirror that's as big as a tennis court. And it's just going to gather so much more light without any of the interference 
of the atmosphere of the earth and you just wonder what kind of wonders it's going to bring back not only when you look up do we see evidence of God for instance take, go to Job chapter 12 Job 12 verse 7 and here the patriarch says but now ask the beasts and they will teach you and the birds of the air and they will tell you or speak to the earth and it will teach you and the fish of the sea will explain to you who among all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this you know all through creation we have evidence of God how how did it happen along the way that there are flowers that could not live without the bees and bees that could not live without flowers when did they enter into an agreement to coexist where was it along the way that these aphids that are protected by ants these ants take care of these little aphid bugs you know they farm them they carry around they protect them they get just like shepherds do their sheep they clean them they groom them and the little aphids drink sap out of the branches and then they feed out of their other end the ants with this sap and they say that they couldn't exist without each other and then there are ants just the ants by themselves just the bugs all over the world would be enough to teach you they got other ants that collect these grains they bring them underground they develop a mold down there they make it into a bread they take it back up above the hole they bake it and then they take it back down below they store it like in a bakery and it's their food ants that are bakers where did they learn that you know even Darwin said the human eye just really destroys my theory because the idea of light striking a rock and giving all this understanding of its environment really you know we all according to the theory of evolution we were just rocks and water isn't that don't you understand that's what it all was just minerals and chemicals and all of a sudden now you're able to take in through your eyes and process with your brain all the light and all the depth and all the messages that are happening around you you can adjust for the distance and you can focus and it just and really you see everything upside down your mind corrects it did you know that and you try and say yep only took 50 million years for all that to happen I'm sorry friends I used to believe that it just you can give me a billion zillion years and it can't explain all of the intelligence and organization interworking systems design it just it doesn't make any sense the only thing that makes sense is that there is a super intelligent being that we call God that brought these things into existence and you know when you're that powerful you can speak them into existence in one day I believe that Romans 1 we got the evidence everywhere it's in the animal kingdom Romans 1 19 and 20 even Paul says because what might be known of God is manifest in them for God has shown it to them he's talking about the even the the Gentiles for since the creation of the world notice Paul doesn't say it evolved his invisible attributes are clearly seen the invisible is clearly seen being understood how by the things that are made in other words we have faith in the unseen based on the seen did you get that out of that verse his invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead so they are without excuse even the pagans and atheists around the world really are without excuse because we are bombarded every day by evidence of a super intelligence that was involved in the creation of this world and uh, to me I think it's pretty clear it says he has made the earth by his power he's established the world by his wisdom and stretched out the heaven by his understanding when he utters his voice there is a multitude of waters in the heavens he spoke remember he created the waters and he separated the waters by his voice he uttered his voice and there is a multitude of waters in the heavens he causes the vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth he makes the lightning for the rain did the power of God and the word of God bring rain suddenly before in the Bible you remember Elijah of course on Mount Carmel but it wasn't just Elijah how many of you remember when Samuel prayed 
because the people had um, disobeyed the Lord and asked for a king, Samuel said, now I'm going to pray. And it's right during harvest time, the last time in the world when you want thunder and rain, I'm going to pray and God is going to send thunder and rain to show you that he's displeased that you have asked for a king. And he prayed and all of a sudden, thunder and, and rain came. Other times, Elijah prayed and fire came down, whether that was lightning or whatever. Three times he prayed and fire came down. I think most of us know this. And this is under the section, Jesus, creator of heaven and earth. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things that were made were made through Him, and without Him nothing was made that was made. Now, that's pretty clear to me. Without Him, how much was made? Zero. Nothing was made without Him. It says, and the Word was God. Not only was He with God, the Word was God. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Why? Because I am the perfect reflection of the Father, because I am God, the Son. Now, as we talk about the relationship of the Father and Son, that may come up more, but it's enough for me to know that everything that exists came into existence by Jesus, which means that Jesus was not brought into existence, that he has always existed. Some people believe that God, way back in the early recesses of eternity, made Jesus, and then he made everything else through Jesus. But how can all things be made through Christ? Did he make himself? That, that, that would create a little contradiction. All right, read for us, please, uh, Genesis 1.24. Then God said, Let the earth bring forth the living creature according to its kind, cattle and creeping thing and beast of the earth, each according to its kind. And it was so. Yeah, notice all the variety that it's got in the world. There's these different species and different types and different categories, classes and kinds of creatures. And they can, you know, frequently reproduce within their kind. And you can take a, um, a peach tree and you can graft just about any stone fruit tree to another stone fruit tree. And you, but you cannot graft the tangerine to a peach. The citrus will not work being grafted that way. You can graft almost any kind of apple tree to one another. I'll probably mention this in my sermon later. It'll fit. But um, I've got a neighbor, and he has an apple tree, and that one apple tree has on it Fuji, Red Delicious, Golden Delicious, Macintosh, Gravenstein, and about a dozen others. Um, one tree. But you can't graft a peach onto an apple tree because it's a stone fruit. They all have their different kinds. And God spoke these different basic kinds into existence. And then he gave man the freedom to be able to create all these different hybrids of those kinds. And that was his job to train the different things in the garden. But he spoke. And it was. Now the Bible says all things that were made were made by him. So in the Bible when it says in the beginning God created, who is the God that created? Well, God the Father was certainly involved because it says, let us make man in our image. But it was certainly Jesus there that was taking the lead in creation. The Father created all things through Christ. Matter of fact, um, I want to show you something here real quick. Um, go with me in your Bibles to the book of Proverbs. <clears throat> Proverbs 8. Please go to Proverbs 8. Let me tell you why I'm saying this. Um, there are a number of people, uh, some are in our church. Of course, you've got uh, a, a whole group of anti-Trinitarian people and others who do not believe that while they say Jesus is now the Son of God, He is not God, and they struggle with that, are Muslim friends. You know, they believe that Jesus was a prophet. And they believe that Jesus is good, but they don't believe that he is God. They struggle with that. They think he was a good man, uh, but um, not, a pro not God. And some people will look here at Proverbs and they'll say, well, it tells us that Jesus was made. And they use this verse here, Proverbs 8.30. I'm, I'm sorry, 8.22 rather. 8.22, I'll read through verse 30. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. 
I was set up from everlasting. Right there they say, see it's talking about his son who was set up from everlasting. From the beginning or, um, or ever the earth was, when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there are no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were settled, before the hills, I was brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth or the fields or the highest part of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass on the face of the depths, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his command, commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, I was by him as one brought up with him. I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him. People read this, they say, ah, here is the clue. It tells us that Jesus was brought forth before he made the world, then he let Jesus create the world. Friends, that's not what this verse is saying. You need to read the beginning of the chapter. Look at Proverbs 8, 1. Does not wisdom cry and understanding put forth her voice? This is a soliloquy that Solomon has on wisdom and it's using the first person but it's all talking about wisdom. And then you, if you read in verse 12, I wisdom dwell with prudence and find out knowledge of witty inventions. The fear of the Lord is to hate pride and arrogancy and the evil way and the froward mouth I do hate. Counsel is mine, sound wisdom, I am understanding, I have strength. So people just take these verses from verse 22 to 30 and they say this is telling us that Jesus was created. It's talking about wisdom. It's talking about wisdom in general. It's just saying God has always had wisdom with him in everything that he's done and Solomon here is extolling that we should all cherish and love wisdom because it's the foundation of God's judgment. It's not talking about the origin of Jesus. Now, I've heard it used that way many times and it's a misapplication of scripture. If you're honest, you read before and you can even go to the end and it all says the whole thing is talking about wisdom. Jesus, the Bible says, is from everlasting to everlasting. It says, I am that I am. He has always existed. Now, stay with me. This is important because we believe Jesus did the creating. And the Bible says in the beginning, we all agree, all things that were made were made by him. But the Bible says in the beginning, God created. So, Jesus is God the Son. Understanding the relationship between the Father and the Son and the Spirit, there's mysteries there, I'll admit that. But Jesus said, uh, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. Those are terms that are used for one who is self-existing. He is 100% God. The only time God was begotten was when Christ came. That's why he's called the only begotten of the Father. God became a man and has forever aligned himself with humanity by doing that. Um, now I was going to read Isaiah 44, 24 in that light. By the way, I almost never do this, but I'm reading from the modern King James Version here. So says Jehovah, your Redeemer, he who formed you from the womb, I am Jehovah who makes all things, who stretches out the heavens alone. Now who is our Redeemer? God, but God the Father, Son. Well, they're both involved, but in particular the Son is our Redeemer. You know, this, this sometimes shakes up my Jehovah Witness friends when you explain, because they don't believe Jesus is God, but when you show them Jesus is Jehovah, all the definitions that you find for Jehovah says Jehovah created the heavens and the earth. Well, we've just read that Jesus did. There's no Savior but Jehovah. It says in the Old Testament, well, Jesus said that He is our Savior. And here it says Jehovah is our Redeemer who formed everything. And so it, it, it sometimes is a struggle for them to understand that, but Jehovah is one of the names for not only God the Father, but for God the Son too, for Jesus. Now, John, in his verse there, in John 1, he uses the word logos. Through the word, all things were created. God can speak things into existence. Now, I'm kind of going on permission now, not commandment, but when Jesus died and he said, I lay my life down and I take it up again, how did he take his life up again? How did Christ raise himself? Some verses say he was raised by the Father, and other verses say he raised himself. How did he raise himself? I have a theory. Did Jesus predict that he would rise after three days? When God speaks something, is it going to happen? 
And the very fact that Christ said that on several occasions, that after the third day I would rise, he put something in motion that his word is so powerful it was going to happen even if he was sleeping in the tomb. Just by the power of his word. But then of course, the Father raised him up. It also says that in several verses. Hebrews 1, verse 1 to 3. I love this verse. God who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets has in these last days spoken to us by his son who he has appointed heir of all things through whom he made not just the world the worlds plural are we the only world did Christ only create this world or did he make the worlds plural who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person Jesus is the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power it's through the word everything is held into place Colossians 1.15 he is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation now when it says he's the firstborn it doesn't mean that he was the first that God made firstborn means the highest like you would call the president's wife the first lady does that mean sequentially she was the first lady to ever come to North America or does it mean that she holds a position of prominence among the women in America and um, in that sense Christ was the greatest of all his creation is when God became a man but he was pre-existed Jesus said before Abraham was I am he said Abraham longed to see my day Jesus is the one who spoke to Abraham and wrestled with Jacob. All right, next section is the Creator among us. And I want someone to look up for me John 9, the Gospel of John, chapter 9, verse 32 and 33. I think we gave that slip to someone. Over here, okay? We'll get you a microphone. And you'll have a minute because I'm going to read some other verses. John 2, verse 7 to 11. This is talking about the miracles. How could God bring the world into existence by His Word? Miracle. You ever seen a miracle? You know, one reason a miracle is a miracle is you don't see it every day. If you said, you know, it's just a miracle how I turn on the spigot and water comes out. Well, it's probably not a miracle. I'm very thankful for it, but it's not a miracle. Um, I'm very thankful when my cold goes away but you can't always call that a miracle because given enough time even if you don't take anything over the counter you're probably going to get over your cold so you don't call that a miracle you can find natural processes and white blood cells to explain that miracles are things for which there is no scientific explanation there are many miracles in the Bible that are unexplainable and we may never be able to explain them if you could they're probably not a miracle see what I'm saying and it was a miracle when God spoke things into existence. We can't explain how He can speak matter into existence. It defies our laws. Well, it also defies laws how you can turn water into wine. How you could fill a pot. I mean, it's not a magician's trick. Fill a pot with water. Christ speaks a word. You pour it out. You got grape juice. How can you do that? The Bible says that's the miracle power of God. And uh, John 2, verse 7, Jesus said, um, He said to them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them to the brim. And He said to them, Draw some out now and take it to the master of the feast. And they took it. And when the master of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, he didn't know where it came from, but the servants who drew the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom, and he said to him, Every man at the beginning sets out the good wine, and when the guests have had plenty to drink, then the inferior you have kept the good or the best wine until now this was the beginning of signs or miracles that Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him he gave them evidence Jesus said one time look if you don't believe because of my word believe for the miracles sake he said I've given you evidence that I have supernatural power there's things we don't understand I I like watching science programs and reading science magazines and I, I find no conflict between science and physics um, and the Bible. I, I, I think there's a lot of things we don't understand but I believe it all works and it all fits. And uh, they were talking about wormholes. 
And you know, they pretty well established that black holes seem to exist in space. Now first for years it was just theory, but they can just see that there's these points that seem to bend light and gobble up all the light around them and, and they're calling that now black holes. And now they're wondering if there are actually parallel universes. And they're exploring, could you go from one dimension or universe into another universe? Let me tell you another way to say that biblically. Is there a spirit world around us right now that we cannot see? Science would call that a parallel universe. It's just a whole other realm that is separated. But they're now trying to find, they're saying that there appears to be scientific and physic evidence that there could be an alter universe that's around us right now that we don't see. And I'm going, uh-huh, yeah, it said that in the Bible all along. It's kind of like when, you know, all of the uh, geologists and the anthropologists and the scientists are talking about the, the fossil record and they finally come out of their room and they make a big announcement and they say, you know, we believe now from all the fossil record it appears that there was some cataclysm. Something happened that caused a global flood that covered all of these animals and killed them quickly and it must have been an asteroid. And we go, oh, you know, we've, we've been saying all along there was a global cataclysm that covered everything with mud and made all these fossils. And no, 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 it can't be the Bible. No, 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 it can't be the Bible. And all of a sudden they come out and they say, it appears there may be some alter universes, some parallel universes out there. I'm going, yeah, it's called the spirit world. And it's like little by little, science is just finding overwhelming evidence that the things that God said may be different terms, but really the same principles have always been there. Yeah, there are miracles and mysteries we can't explain. Adam and Eve, I believe, used to talk to God face to face. Doesn't the Bible say that? I believe that Adam and Eve were not sequestered from seeing angels. I don't think Adam and Eve were held captive on this planet. I think they could have soared through space and the Bible says there was a meeting in the book of Job where the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. Right? It's not on the earth because Satan says I came from the earth to this meeting. Well Adam was called the son of God. Do you think he would have been denied access to that meeting before he sinned? Of course he could have come to that meeting so he could leave the planet. But after sin, man lost that whole universe, that whole spiritual realm. Man lost it. His robes of light went out. They saw their nakedness. Something radical happened. Man was quarantined to the very narrow physical world that we live in now. And the problem with most of us is we think that everything that we see around us is it. And we don't realize there's an eternity that we don't see. All right, so these miracles remind us of that. That was one of the first miracles. All right, I was going to have someone read for me John 9, 32 and 33. And this is another big miracle in the Gospel of John. Are we ready for that? I think we still are. Go ahead. Since the world began, it has been unheard of that anyone opened the eyes of one who was born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. You know, it's nothing new that there are unbelievers in our world that deny the miraculous power of Jesus. When Christ opened the eyes of this man in John chapter 9, the whole chapter is dedicated to this miracle. This man who is born blind, he's never seen. And you know, I understand that when you've lived that long completely blind, that even if they could restore your eyes, the part of your brain that processes sight still couldn't see. So this is not just a healing of the eyes, it has to be a healing of the brain for this man to be able to see and to be able to process all those colors and understand that's miraculous. That's like a person born knowing how to talk. It just doesn't happen. It was a first class miracle like raising Lazarus who'd been dead for four days. And Jesus did this and everyone knew this was the man and they said this is too much, we can't believe it. He's an imposter, bring in his parents. And so the Sanhedrin, they bring in the parents and they say, we can tell you this is our son and that he was born blind. We don't know how he can see because they, they knew that they'd be excommunicated if they said they thought that Jesus had performed this miracle. But it was a first class miracle. But even then, and here these are leaders in the church. They said, no, this can't be. And even the man has been healed. He says, what's wrong with you? This, Jesus has to be from God. This is a miracle. I was born blind and now I see. There's things we can't explain that God performs. Then you've got uh, John 6, 
verse 8 through 10. Another miracle. We're just spot checking a couple of supernatural miracles to illustrate that the power of God that brought the world into existence was a miracle. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said, There's a lad here who has five barley loaves and two small fish, but what are they among so many? And Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down. The number was about 5,000. Can you imagine the disciples trying to force the miracle of feeding 5,000 people with five loaves of bread? Now these are little japati like tortillas. They're not the big old, you know, French loaves of bread that they had. It had to be a miracle because everybody not only was filled, but there's 12 baskets of leftovers. See what I'm saying? God always substantiates his miracles. It's like when um, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are thrown in the fiery furnace and everyone says it was a miracle. They survived the fire. Well, someone, you know, you hear these people say, oh, it wasn't that. You know, people walk on hot coals all the time. It's scientific. You can explain it. That fire was not that hot. Well, it was hot enough to kill the soldiers that threw them in. The Lord does everything he can to substantiate these miracles to show there are some things that you can't explain. <clears throat> you just can't understand it. We need to accept that there are miracles. But there is evidence in the Bible. There are so many things I see in the Bible, like I said, prophecy, and people's lives that are being changed by the Word of God that to me are evidence that the Bible is trustworthy. It's trustworthy historically. It's tr trustworthy in its uh, cooperation, in its conciseness, in its um, unity, in the way it's been preserved, that I believe the other things it's said. And Lord bless you till we study together again next week. Is Jesus God is what we have been discussing. And thank you once again, Mr. Say, for thank joining you. us. And a happy new year once again. Many you happy returns. Sure, <laughs> sure. All right, so um, we'll see you same time next week on another edition of Expectations. Expectations, Jesus will come on time. See you. Sorry. <laughs> It's not hard for them to figure out the way you show Jesus. You know love is what they heard, and you didn't even say a word. Ain't it funny that's the way it works? So when you know Jesus, oh, it's like flipping on a light switch when you're walking into this room. It's so You're right there to pick me up, so when you bring